Welcome. My name is Philip Martin. I'm a senior investigative reporter with WGBH Radio and Television in Boston. And uh, we're here to talk about one of the world's perhaps most underreported problems, a very serious uh, and very brutal uh, crisis in our world. It's called human trafficking. Many refer to it as modern day slavery. And we're it manifests in many ways in terms of labor, people being forced to toil against their will, some as young as 10, 9, 8, 6, 7 years old. And we're here to talk about sex trafficking around the world, and we're here to discuss how conflict and extremism uh, abets human trafficking. Uh, as you've seen with photographs, as you've, as you've seen with videos of ISIS and Boko Haram in Nigeria, and how they contribute to human trafficking. Um, I just returned from Thailand, actually on an unrelated trip, looking at um, malaria. But while there, the issue uh, there and in Cambodia, it still hits you in the face. It's always apparent. Talking to some folks, uh, men, who are seriously underpaid, uh, virtually uh, slave labor on some of the plantations in Cambodia, but not quite. It really is not that. But they spoke about how the conditions were so bad that some individuals on the plantation left to go to the coast, and some disappeared on fishing vessels. Uh, one confirmed to have died on the, on the high seas. You may have been following the New York Times extraordinary series on the out, out, Outlaw Sea, and uh, some of the stories about human trafficking uh, in the fishing industry in Thailand. But of course, human trafficking is also something that takes place right here in the United States, uh, sometimes underneath our own eyes and noses, sometimes manifest in um, ways that are uh, surprising and, uh, and insidious. Uh, nail salons uh, is one example of, that we've seen around the country. Uh, today's program is an hour long, <clears throat> and it's a collaboration of the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and PRI's The World and WGBH. I'd like to introduce our panelists, uh, starting from my immediate right, are Jacqueline Baba. She's uh, the professor of practice of health and human rights at, here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And Dan Vexler just came in from London. He's the director of programs at the Freedom Fund. And Jocelyn Kelly, director of Harvard Humanitarian Initiatives Women in War program. And joining us remotely, as you can see on the screen, is Martina Vandenberg. She's founder and president of the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center. And we have a great uh, a clear picture of you, Martina, and we'll be uh, very happy that you could join us, uh, albeit remotely. Uh, this program will include a brief question and answer, and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu, and you can also participate in a live chat discussion that's happening on the forum site right now. At this very moment, if you'd like to join us, please do. Before we introduce our panelists, what I'd like to do is to help you better understand the dynamics and the horror, if you will, of human trafficking. And in the forms of the faces of trafficking, I'd like you to watch part of a video from the Freedom Fund. Most people think that slavery ended in the 1800s, but sadly that's not the case. Slavery still exists today in every country and across a wide range of industries. An estimated 30 million men, women and children are presently enslaved around the world. 30 million. The varieties of modern slavery are nearly endless. In India, men, women and children are forced to work in brick kilns, mines and stone quarries. In countries like Thailand, hundreds of thousands of women and girls are tricked and coerced into a life of violent sexual abuse and then discarded onto the streets when their health fails them. In war-torn Africa, children are kidnapped by warlords, forced to become child soldiers and subjected to a brutal life of conflict and violence. The list goes on. Forced labour, domestic servitude, forced marriage and other forms of abuse. Yet despite the many names and faces of modern slavery, the essence of this crime remains the same depriving highly vulnerable human beings of their liberty and subjecting them to extreme exploitation. And that's just, again, the faces of human trafficking. We're going to hear more about the work of the Freedom Fund 
uh, in a few minutes. But before then, let's turn to uh, Jacqueline Baba, uh, whose center runs a, a, a program to address human trafficking and forced labor, uh, which is actually the greatest and largest uh, aspect of human trafficking in the world, forced labor. She's going to give us the big picture. Thank you very much, Philip. And I'm so glad we're having this discussion here. Um, the big picture, I think, was nicely illustrated by that moving set of clips we just saw. It's one of pervasive poverty, um, power inequality, domination, and brutality. Despite the variations we saw, young boys, older people uh, all over the world, um, there are certain common elements which recur again and again and again. And in a way, it's surprising that the problem continues to be so pervasive, given that um, we understand so much about it and we actually have been following and tracking it for so long. So why is it with us and why is it such a big uh, human rights uh, real tragedy, actually, in our contemporary world? So I just want to make a couple of points, if, if I may, to kick off our discussion. The first is, I think, that we um, have often made the problem more complex than it is. There are many different terms that are used to describe this uh, set of situations. So, uh, you know, we talk about modern slavery, we talk about trafficking, we talk about forced or bonded labor, we talk about exploitation. There's a lot of different terminology, and I think sometimes um, this is helpful and sometimes it's obfuscatory. It's helpful because each of these terms has their own legal framework and legal frameworks deliver or at least attempt to deliver solutions and remedies. And so in one sense, it's important to be precise about what we're referring to, not to call everything slavery, uh, not to call everything trafficking, but to be precise because that's a way of being likely, more likely to enhance intervention. So that, I think, is the good side of this diversity. The bad side is that I think people think this is something very remote, very distant, very obscure. You know, we think of some of these exotic images, if you like, of, you know, child soldiers in East West Africa or very young girls in Vietnam or Cambodia. And we don't realize that in every community there are people who are vulnerable. Every community that we inhabit, places that we go to, shopping malls we go to, um, hotels where we dine and so on. On. So I think that complexity is not helpful. Um, let me just answer a little bit about your question about the big picture and the reasons, and I'm sure we'll come back to that in our discussion. Um, I think one of the pervasive reasons for trafficking, not the only reason and not always the reason, but one of the pervasive reasons is dire poverty. Dire poverty, dire um, economic social need. So um, the lack of access to a reasonable, a rights protecting job where you can make a, a, a decent living is something that drives people into these des desperate situations. And related to that, enormous power inequality. So the landlord who can completely control your life, the pimp who can control your life. Um, the, you know, many of these examples are enormous power inequality, sometimes exacerbated by caste differences or age differences, or gender differences, or nation nationality differences, or all of the above. So that's an enormously important set of factors. But there are others. And I think the others are, in some ways, less well known and maybe it's certainly at least as pernicious. Mm -hmm. One of them, I think, is um, the desire for a better life, for aspiration, for hope, for, for opportunity, for adventure that so many young people um, are driven by and increasingly in our connected, um, internet mediated world, that's, that's the case. So people dream of a better life, but they have no legal way of accessing it. And so they're susceptible to all manner of, of fraud or deceit or, or other means. And this is not just for people who are trying to get from Myanmar to Netherlands. It's people who are trying to get from a, 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 a broken home or a, a violent home in Boston to the city lights of New York. And so people in different ways are kind of led to believe that there is a way out and that way out is often very abusive. And that's why we see uh, this mixture of 
economic desperation, but also sort of a, a, an angst about um, living a better life that often leads people into these dire situations. So I think those are two kind of separate, but often, um, you know, often manifest themselves together sets of factors. Jacqueline, I think that's an, that's an extraordinary overview, and it, it definitely talks about the addresses the problem, <coughs> that it's not just a question of, um, of Thailand or Cambodia or Brazil or Santa or the Dominican Republic, but uh, here in Boston, right down the street at Blue Hill Avenue, you can see vestiges of the problem. And uh, that's uh, a cue for me to turn to uh, Dan, Dan Vexler, who's the director of programs at the Freedom Fund, which has been set up to address the worldwide uh, a problem of human trafficking uh, from the streets of London in Dublin to, uh, to the streets of Bom Bombay, Mumbai, and, uh, and uh, in Kochi. Uh, Dan, can you tell us about the program and how you're addressing this uh, scourge of uh, human trafficking? Sure. Thanks, Philip, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to participate on the panel. The Freedom Fund is uh, an anti-slavery foundation. We were established um, by three other foundations last year, the Legatum Foundation, um, Humanity United, and the Walk Free Foundation, who were all uh, funding anti-slavery programs at the time, but felt that um, by coming together to form the Freedom Fund, they could mobilize more funding uh, into anti-slavery programs and more research into what works. They felt, um, <clears throat> and I think they were right, that given the scale of the problem, there really wasn't the awareness that there needed to be, and um, certainly not the level of funding. It's estimated that the rich country development uh, agencies spend around $120 million a year on anti-slavery programs, which isn't that much. Um, I came to the Freedom Fund 18 months ago, having spent my career in international development NGOs in a number of countries. And I've found it really interesting um, that the phenomenon of slavery uh, and efforts to tackle it haven't really penetrated mainstream development and humanitarian practice. So the Freedom Fund's approach is to focus uh, our resources on slavery hotspots, places like India, Nepal, Thailand, where prevalence is high. We are a big believer in grassroots NGOs. We think they are a really effective way to fight slavery at the local level. And they can also build that bottom-up pressure uh, for change. We're funding about 60 grassroots NGOs right now in six uh, slavery hotspots. And our goal is to identify which models uh, work. We're fun they're they're um, running a range of interventions and then work with others to get those models uh, more widely adopted. We're also trying to impact the bigger systems at play by supporting national and international organizations who are trying to influence governments and the private sector to fulfill their responsibilities. Um, I would say that the big challenge that I see uh, is that slavery generally is not about chance. It's not about unlucky victims who are tricked or kidnapped by random predators. This is about whole segments of societies who are vulnerable because they are poor or because of who they are, be it um, low caste Dalits in Indian brick kilns, Burmese migrant workers who are trafficked onto Thai fishing vessels and forced to work 20 hours a day for months on end in appalling conditions, um, Ethiopian women and girls who migrate to the Middle East to be domestic workers and are then trafficked into slavery. These are groups that are preyed upon by a system of exploitation. I mean, there are whole industries that are reliant on, on um, these people. So that means that we have to do more than um, help individuals and prosecute low-level traffickers. We need to be looking at the underlying dynamics. How can we give these groups more power? How can we um, make it harder for people to exploit them? And just one quick uh, example, um, I was in India a few weeks ago where we're supporting a number of organizations and they're trying to address the system of uh, bonded labor that has kept whole villages in slavery, um, sometimes for generations. 
And what they're trying to do is to bring about a psychological transition to um, explain that slavery is illegal under Indian law, even if it's not always enforced. Uh, it's unjustifiable, and it doesn't have to be your destiny um, to, uh, to live like this. And then at the same time, look at the, look at the practical transition. How do you exit from slavery? How do we get other sources of income, access to government entitlements? So that's one example of uh, the kind of work that we're trying to support. Thanks, Dan. Uh, you, you talked about groups that are being targeted. And I guess uh, you, there's probably no greater example of that than women who are being targeted during conflict. Uh, and um, you also sp you spoke about the, pre uh, the precision of language. And uh, we're, here we have a situation where slavery is uh, unequivocally uh, where this is unequivocally slavery when we're talking about groups like ISIS, for example, who recruit <coughs> based on uh, the uh, based on a slave campaign. They recruit individuals from around around the world. <coughs> so Jocelyn heads up a program that's called Women in War, and uh, that's at the Harvard Humanitarian Ish Initiative. And uh, tell us about the program, Jocelyn, and uh, what exactly we're talking about when we talk about again, unequivocally, unequivocal slavery, unambiguous in terms of what we're talking about, in terms of language, uh, in the context of ISIS, Boko Haram, and other conflicts around the world. Absolutely. Thank you, Philip. And it's a pleasure to be a part of such a remarkable event. Um, from investigations throughout Central Africa, the Women in War program at HHI has gained rare insights into how armed groups exploit people to further their own strategic goals. The question of human slavery and trafficking in conflict zones presents one of the most complex challenges to the field of public health today. And you, this is because you have a problem that is largely invisible, trafficking, embedded in the world's most inaccessible, complex, and dangerous places. And this presents a challenge for public health, but I think it's a challenge that we're ready to face. Um, I've spent 10 years working with communities and state and non-state armed groups and conflict zones, doing assessments of human exploitation in these areas. And during this time, I've seen the nature of conflict continue to change. Currently, we're in a world where groups like the Lord's Resistance Army, Boko Haram, and ISIS use abduction, forced recruitment, and sexual slavery as a core pillar of their identity and as part of their appeal to potential fighters. The groups use psychological control, kidnapping, and enslavement to remarkable effect, and it's become a central weapon in their arsenal. Today, the Women in War program at HHI is actually launching two reports in our investigation into the Lord's Resistance Army, which you can find on the HHI website. And in interviews with long-term combatants, we learned about these highly systematic and ritualized systems that this rebel group has used and adapted over a long period of time in order to control its abductees. Um, one example of this is that women are given to combatants as wives in a very ritualized way. And these perverse family units give fighters a sense of stability and control in a highly dangerous and fluid environment. So it's a way of drawing them into the group, keeping them there, and then controlling their behavior through creating kind of this socialized system. And it's actually a technique that we see used by many rebel groups throughout the world. Boko Haram and ISIS are just two other examples. Um, the project with the Lord's Resistance Army also highlighted a number of broader dynamics that we see related to slavery in war generally. Um, and I think they're worth highlighting and, and also highlight how we sometimes use different words and names for some of the same um, systems of slavery and exploitation. But it, there can be a danger in calling one thing child soldiering, calling another thing human slavery. And sometimes it almost separates the fields or creates a centrifuge where things begin to separate out when we're all talking about the same dynamics. So some of the things that we, we see in conflict that are highly related to human slavery and exploitation are abduction and forced recruitment of children um, who can then be used as transporters, sex slaves, or soldiers. Trafficking in persons across borders is very common as arm armed groups exploit border regions with very little government control. Women and children and men are all vulnerable to trafficking and, sexual and exploitation, but they can face different profiles of risk. 
Um, and the fear of trafficking and slavery can actually stop entire communities from farming, trading, seeking health services, and accessing clean water. Um, and I will also note that something incredibly important that was highlighted by Professor Baba is that um, economic systems can be very powerful but sometimes less visible ways of controlling people. And in conflict, old economic systems crumble. And then sometimes highly exploitative economic institutions or conflict economies can evolve. And these can involve labor trafficking, debt bondage, and um, other forms of slavery. Something um, on a final point that I think is important to highlight is that as countries move from active conflict into post-conflict situations, more visible forms of traffic like child slavery or sexual slavery can decrease, but harder to assess systems of exploitation like debt bondage can then arise. So um, I just think it's highly uh, important to highlight that we as a community should continue to explicitly acknowledge and assess the profiles of slavery in the conflicts we see around the world and recognize that different conflicts will have different profiles of abuse and that um, addressing this problem involves both holding perpetrators accountable and also creating services to help survivors of slavery um, recover both financially and psychologically. Jocelyn, one uh, point uh, that you've made here about what happens overseas can also be made um, in, in, in a very different way. And again, dealing with the pre precision of language, as Jackie has pointed out, um, it, we all know that a lot of the sexual exploitation, there's explicit sexual exploitation, and there's this uh, assumption of coercion uh, that we all talk about when we talk about human trafficking. Uh, we often divide the, the two. Uh, but uh, at one point, there's a nexus, and that is to say there's an exploiter uh, or a, a groups of exploiters. Uh, and I saw that in a series I, uh, I put together called Underground Trade, which looked at the uh, sex trade, if you will. And I, I don't even like to use the term sex trade. It sounds like it's something that, that's um, commercially viable. Uh, but sexual exploitation uh, that occurred up and down the I-95 corridor with New York as a as a as a hub for activity coming all the way up to Boston, Providence, parts of New Hampshire, so on and so forth, and the connection in this case to East Asia. But what we see all over this country, all over the United States, all over Britain, <coughs> Ireland, um, every, elsewhere, what we call our domestic um, uh, exploitation problem, <coughs> we see uh, uh, predators, pimps, and, um, and customers, clients, Johns, who essentially uh, don't, who basically use these uh, girls and boys often uh, as uh, their, their commodity, as their form of making money. Now, one of the public service announcements, we'd like to show several, but we're going to show one, <coughs> was produced by a group called GEM. I think you may be familiar with GEM out of New York. Girls, I'm sorry? GEMS. GEMS, oh, thank you very much. That's right, GEMS, Girls Educational and Mentoring Services. Uh, a similar program exists here in the Boston area. My Life, My Choice, uh, Kim's uh, Project, all types of projects like this exist all over the country. But this one, this particular public service announcement is very, very, uh, uh, it's powerful. And this uh, is, GEMS is an organization which helps girls who have experienced commercial sexual exploitation and domestic trafficking. Uh, again, oftentimes this happens right under our noses. Let's watch. I was 13, 10, 14. I was 12 when I got into the life. I met this guy and he was so fine. He was older. He would buy me stuff. He kept telling me how pretty I was and that he was going to take care of me. And so I thought he was my boyfriend. But then he told me I couldn't go home. Every night on the streets, different men bought me. They would beat me, rob me, hit me. They didn't care how old I was. Sometimes I would get arrested. I told the cops that I was too scared to leave, but they didn't care. Sometimes my pimp would come and bail me out. But he and the men that used to buy me never got arrested. People think that this only happens in countries like Thailand and India, Africa, Russia. But this is happening right here in New York. I'm from right here from the Bronx. Syracuse. Best Eye. Harlem. New York City. To make a difference, contact GEMS at gems-girls.org. 212-926-8089. Martina Vandenberg, who is uh, who's going to join us uh, within seconds, uh, is one of those making a difference.
uh, trying to work, working with, not trying, but working with the survivors and victims of human trafficking. Uh, Martina is a, uh, an attorney, a former human, human Rights Watch researcher who founded the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center, which connects victims, many of us like to use the term survivors, to pro bono lawyers. Martina, welcome and uh, tell us about your work. Thank you so much, Philip. It's an honor to be on the panel, even remotely from Washington, DC. The fundamental mission of HT Pro Bono, as we call ourselves, the fundamental mission is to ensure that every single trafficking victim has a lawyer and preferably has a pro bono attorney. One of the really terrible moments of that video that you just saw was the young woman saying, I was arrested. One of the things that we see around the world, but also in the United States, is that trafficking victims are arrested for crimes that their traffickers force them to commit. And so one of the cutting edge areas of law for human trafficking survivors in the United States, spearheaded by Kate Mogulescu and others in New York, is really trying to vacate all of those convictions. But it's not just about sort of undoing the damage that the criminal justice system has done to victims of trafficking who are trapped in the sex industry here in the United States. It's also sort of panning out and taking a broader spectrum because just as people believe that, that sex trafficking only happens in Thailand and, and India, people also seem to believe that, that labor trafficking only happens abroad. One of the shocking things in the United States is that we also have tremendous forced labor in the United States. And so the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center fundamentally does referrals for trafficking survivors in the United States, hooking them up with lawyers, connecting them with lawyers who can do two things. One is work very hard to try and make sure that there is a prosecution to end impunity for human trafficking because impunity is the unfortunately the flavor of the day. Last year there were only 208 prosecutions at the federal level in the entire country in the United States and of those 190 were for sex and 18 were for forced labor. That's, that's a reflection of what we see around the world where the ILO says that there are about 14.6 million people held in some form of forced labor. And, uh, and the reality is that the State Department last year count, counted 418 prosecutions in the entire world for forced labor. So fundamentally, if we're gonna change this system, we need to advance survivors' rights within the legal system, both nationally here in the United States and internationally, which is why we're working very hard to push prosecutions, but also engage in civil litigation on behalf of trafficking survivors. And not just any civil litigation, but strategic litigation so that we can start to uproot the systems and, and create a deterrent through the legal system to end these crimes. Uh, this is a good time to ask a, a question. Uh, civil litigation, um, who are you suing? That's a great question. So Congress gave us an enormous gift. You know, Congress does so many things badly. But in 2003, they gave us an excellent, excellent law. And essentially, the law provides a remedy. Professor Baba talked about the importance of remedies. The law provides a remedy. So a civil attorney representing a trafficking survivor can now, under US law, bring a case in federal court for any crimes that a federal prosecutor could have brought. And so we're obviously suing for money. We're not putting anyone in prison. But the outcomes in these cases can be remarkable. So for example, we did a domestic servitude case, a trafficking case, a woman held in forced labor in a home. She was held for approximately four months, but there was very, very violent sexual assault while she was being held. And the remedy in that case was a $3.3 million judgment. So the Southern Poverty Law Center, for example, has done amazing litigation using this particular legal vehicle, 18 U.S.C. 1595, which is the law, and they brought a case against a corporation in the United States called Signal International on behalf of hundreds of men from India who had been trafficked into the United States for forced labor to repair the shipyards after Hurricane Katrina. These were men who arrived in the United States from India. They were skilled laborers. They had legal visas. They anticipated they would have legal jobs, and they thought that they were getting green cards. And what they experienced in the United States was frankly shocking. The judgment in the case for five of those victims, just five, the first case to go forward, that judgment was $14 million. 
I did some sort of math on the back of an envelope to see what the damages would be if all 250 victims ended up before a jury and each case went as well as the first. It would have been close to $750 million. So that corporation, Signal International, has gone into Chapter 11. It settled the case with the Indian workers for $20 million. And perhaps the most telling moment was the comment on the Wall Street Journal blog where the writer said, you know, we've long known that human trafficking is morally bankrupt, but now we understand that it can also financially bankrupt a company. I, I got to tell you, that what, what you've described here, uh, not just an example of a, of, of a company being sued. Signal, I think, is out of Mississippi, correct? Or That's Alabama. Right. That's right. That the, you're also doing something which, when oftentimes, I'm afraid, when reporters talk about human trafficking, uh, let's just say media, too often it's, uh, it's in a ways that are not complex, but also in a way that too often can be exploitative uh, in terms of the sensational nature of, this, of, of talking about this topic. And what this panel seems to uh, be doing, very clearly doing, is embracing the complexity of, of human trafficking. And in that regard, I'd like to turn to Jackie to talk about some of the factors that lead to human trafficking. You spoke uh, about uh, uh, poverty, income inequality. Uh, elaborate on th that as a factor in terms of the um, prolongation of, uh, of, of trafficking. Well, Philip, I think as, as several of us have said, these are complicated phenomena and they have many different components. And so income scarcity, poverty, hunger, uh, is certainly a factor, but uh, that manifests itself in many ways. So if we just stick with the United States to start with, we know, and I'm sure Martina uh, has dealt with these cases, we know that children coming out of child welfare are often extremely vulnerable to um, trafficking. And particularly to sexual exploitation. These are children, of course, who have faced, who face poverty. They come out of a, a, a situation where they have no family standing behind them. Like foster care. Like sure. foster care or like being in a group home. But it's not just poverty. It's also the lack of a family, the lack of mentors, the lack of somebody really looking out for you. And so um, they are enormously susceptible. And, and I think Dan was quite right to say this is not just sort of one evil person tricking uh, a naive or a gullible girl. This is a system which builds and feeds off these sorts of vulnerabilities. We know, and colleagues who work, for example, in California and Oakland have told us that there are these members of networks that lurk around um, some of the child welfare institutions, knowing that this is that there is a kind of, if you like, prey there, and, and really using the vulnerability of, of young people emerging from those situations. So that's one context in which poverty translates. Another, um, which we've seen actually here in our own in our own community in in Boston and in, in Cambridge, that kind of you know wealthy ivory tower. Um, we've seen is, is homelessness, children who are homeless, who are living on the streets, um, whether because they've been thrown out of their homes, whether because they, they've emerged from, from foster care and have nowhere to go, whether because they're undocumented migrants, whether because they're LGBT and, you know, have, have been rejected by their families. Could be many reasons. So, again, poverty intersects with other vulnerabilities. So, um, and then of course in, the, in the, some of the, the clips we've seen, we, we see these inherited systems of, of gross exploitation. So at worst, bonded labor is transmitted gener intergenerationally for, for many generations. This is like, this is what happens. So you have a small debt that uh, a family, you know, takes out because they have a health emergency or because there was a fire and their small, you know, house burnt down. And that debt, small amount, could be fifty dollars, um, needs to be serviced, and the interest on the debt needs to be serviced. And so you have a situation where, you know, two generations later, little children are given over to the debt holder, to the exploiter, to repay in kind through their labor that debt. And we see this all the time. So again, it's, it's this multifactorial combination of 
great economic and social need and, and inequality combined with structures which are oppressive. And of course that raises the question is, what can you do? That is, how, did, how do you create a secure community? Uh, whether it is uh, post foster care, or, or whether it is in the context of uh, the type of um, terrorist extremist organizations where uh, people are dealing with like ISIS, and for that matter, the Afghan military, uh, which preys on children in um, uh, in a, a U.S. ally uh, in in Afghanistan. Uh, how do you secure uh, uh, Dan uh, Jocelyn a community such that? Um, you basically, uh, uh, you can't eradicate it at the moment, it seems, but, but you, at least you, you start to chip away at human trafficking. Well, I mean, I talked a little bit uh, earlier about, um, about the communities in India where um, you need to start with a psychological transition um, and build that bottom-up pressure. So one of the things that um, the NGOs we're working with are doing is um, forming community vigilance committees and um, connecting those committees to other committees and similar communities and starting to build that sense of um, confidence that you can challenge uh, the traffickers. Um, and to look at another example in Thailand, um, the vulnerability also comes because of failures in the rule of law. So those uh, Burmese migrants who are on fishing vessels out at sea, one of the big issues and one of the reasons they're so vulnerable is because the Thai government is failing in its duty to inspect those boats and to regulate that industry. So we need to be looking also at failures in the rule of law and what are the levers that we have to try and influence that. In Thailand's case, the seafood industry is a huge global industry. I think it's the third largest seafood industry in the world. Um, a lot of that seafood goes to the US, goes to the European Union. And so there's an opportunity there. If we can um, get this issue in the media spotlight, put the Thai government under pressure, then you can start to, to chip away at that because it's not a government that doesn't have the ability to enforce the law. They're very effective in, in many other areas, but it's about generating political will. Mm -hmm. sure. You know, mm -hmm. something that I found so striking and eerie about Professor Baba's remarks um, related to the risk factors of foster children, particularly maybe young girls who are coming out of the foster system who don't have families and how that's a risk factor for exploitation is that we actually see that in a place that doesn't couldn't possibly seem more different or more removed which is Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo and we did a project with um, former child soldiers and children demobilizing from armed groups both with young boys and young girls and what we saw is that they both were equally vulnerable to being um, exploited by armed groups but they had very different risk factors and understanding those profiles of risk was absolutely key to helping to prevent their recruitment into armed groups and the risk factor for these young girls was actually that they did not have family structures to help protect them from being absorbed into these armed groups and frankly um, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's an element of this um, in the U.S. as well. Some of the girls were absorbed into armed groups somewhat easily because they so badly needed a protector in this incredibly dangerous and complex landscape that the devil you know is almost better than the devil you don't. So they got um, protection from a particular armed groups so they didn't face exploitation from every armed group. And in contrast, young boys were recruited through bribery, lies, or on the road to school or market. So again, different pathways into the same kind of exploitation. And I think I'll just note, um, just to, to build on the point that was already made, it's incredibly important not just to document clear cases of sexual exploitation and abuse, because in a way we've already, the problem has already happened, but something that we're trying to do a little bit better in conflict um, situations is to understand kind of the landscape of vulnerability that might get you to a clear case of human trafficking and slavery, but it's much easier to ask about clear specific indicators than to ask someone, you know, do you feel like you are currently enslaved? And said you, you can ask people things like, do you feel safe leaving your job at night? Do you feel like you might be 
controlled by a particular family member or boss? Do you feel like um, your job is coercive or intimidating in some ways, et cetera, et cetera? And so asking specific questions but that are really informed by these local contexts is incredibly important. And one quick note is that we've actually been using a lot of art-based or visual methodologies to better understand that because um, I, something I'm very um, aware of and that is very humbling is that sometimes we found we come in as foreign researchers with assumptions that we don't even know that we're making. And so creating a number of methodologies, both traditional and non-traditional, really helps us to understand what, for instance, former child soldiers are going through. So we'll have them create art, and through that art, they're actually able to tell their stories in a really unique and beautiful way. And we've done the same with the LRA project, where um, communities literally mapped the social geography of where they live and how that's changed as a result of insecurity. Lord's Resistance Army. Absolutely, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I invite people, we've put that on the web so people from around the world can actually look at how these communities are visually depicting their own challenges. You, this is, uh, the, the whole uh, confrontation against um, uh, modern day slavery, human trafficking, these various forms of super exploitation, uh, you've done well to talk about how um, what type of, um, of security that might we might put in place in order to address these issues. But one of the questions uh, uh, that's still out there is legal recourse. Uh, the uh, international court, uh, the uh, judges within various uh, regions, so on and so forth. Martina, you, you spoke um, about legal recourse in the United States, civil suits, for example, using the Southern Poverty Law Center model uh, in Signal, for example. But what can be done on the international level if you were talking about 418 prosecutions worldwide? Right, so that's just the number for forced labor. The number, if you look at all prosecutions for all forms of exploitation, was still only about 10,000 in the world in 2014. So what's, what's interesting is you know, the, the, the Rome Statute that created the International Criminal Court is so narrowly drafted that many of us despaired of ever seeing a trafficking case prosecuted before the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Um, I think that ISIS, which has embraced the language of slavery and, and actively uh, brags about the fact that it's committing these crimes, has, has made it, I think, actually possible that we might in our lifetime see a prosecution before the International Criminal Court. But the low numbers of prosecutions, whether it's before an international tribunal or before national prosecutorial systems, national judicial systems, what those low prosecution numbers say to me is that waiting for the criminal justice system to eradicate human trafficking is like waiting for Godot. It's simply not going to happen. And so we have to use absolutely every legal weapon at our disposal to try and go after the traffickers and create a deterrence that clearly, that clearly the criminal justice system is not creating at this juncture. And so, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center model and the civil litigation that we do has not just uh, efficacy here in the United States, but another gift that Congress gave us in 2008 is extraterritorial jurisdiction. So the way that the law is now written, thanks to Senator Durbin and, and the Senate, the way the law is now written is if a U.S. citizen commits an act of trafficking abroad, or if a legal permanent resident commits an act of trafficking abroad, or even if someone who is now present in the United States and is tagged has committed human trafficking abroad, we can prosecute that individual and we can bring civil damages cases against that individual. So the expansion of extraterritorial jurisdiction in the human trafficking world is remarkable, particularly when you consider how extraterritorial jurisdiction to bring sort of foreign cases in US courts is narrowing under almost every single other set, every other fact pattern. So we have not seen very many of these cases, unfortunately. The, the federal government is not bringing very many extraterritorial cases. Highly troubling because one of the first, uh, one of the first cases brought with using, attempting to use the extraterritorial jurisdiction was actually a case brought against US government military contractors alleging the use of third country nationals as forced laborers on US military bases in Iraq. And I think very few people know about that case, but that was one of the first efforts to bring an extraterritorial case into the US courts on the basis of forced labor.
You also, have, I'm sorry, please go no, ahead, Jackie. No, I, I, I mean, I mm -hmm. just wanted to jump in to mm -hmm. say, um, to, to, to build on this and to say, I think therefore what comes out of this discussion is we need many different tools in our, in our toolbox. We need to think very much about legal remedies and both domestically and internationally. Um, we need to think about, you know, psychological remedies for recovery and, and, and survival. But I think, you know, one of the things that we haven't maybe quite uh, emphasized enough is the importance of prevention. And I think one of the things that our center feels very strongly, and I know all, all my colleagues here also feel, is that um, when, when we think about anti-trafficking or anti-slavery work, we think about remedies post facto. And of course, that's essential. But as essential, or even more so, is to try to prevent those harms from happening in the first place. And so we need to think about what we know about the risk factors or the triggers, if you like, and address them as early as possible. So we need to build resilient communities as the kind of current buzzword. We need to think about how you strengthen education systems, how you strengthen healthcare system, how you strengthen family systems in complex and fractured uh, contexts. And that, of course, is, is a big ask. But um, I think we cannot just focus our resources post facto. This is, I think, one of the problems in, in the way we've approached the problem. Not to say that we don't need to do that, not to say we don't need more prosecutions and we don't need more civil cases, but we also need to think that anti-trafficking or anti-slavery means education. It means long-term investment in very troubled contexts. In other words, a structural approach to yeah. attacking human trafficking. Exactly. Uh, and just one other aspect of that, and then I'm, I'm just going to ask a final question of our, our panel. I, Martina and, and Jackie, in that regard, I'm thinking about a single case that brought by Equality Now against uh, sex tourists, a sex tourism company, which, the, which they lost. They, uh, this was a case that um, Equality Now out of New York brought against uh, a, a company, uh, two individuals representing that company, uh, and they seem to have lost this case uh, in terms of uh, its, its larger impact uh, in, a, uh, in a court in New York. And with that type of message, I'm wondering how you actually, uh, how, do you, how the U.S., for example, uh, is dealing, quote, unquote, effectively with the question of, of human trafficking. And I have another question too, just, and, and let me throw this out. Migrants, right now, this, this is what we're talking about all over the world. Uh, uh, more people are on the move now uh, than they have been since World War II, from, um, from the Middle East to, um, to Europe, from Africa to Europe, uh, from the Rohingya in Burma to, Mayan, uh, to Malaysia. More people are on the move, which means more people are being exploited. And I'm wondering, how do you address the question of so many people moving about where there is often no rule of law mm -hmm. uh, and there often is no structural way of dealing with uh, those people who are waiting um, on the margins to exploit these individuals, if you will. I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, <clears throat> I think um, Jackie mentioned earlier that people are becoming more aware of what's happening in other places and thinking about about migrating to places they might not have in the past. Um, in Ethiopia, it's not about an, is an, an issue of not knowing the risks. The women, in, there have been studies showing that the women and the girls who are migrating to the Middle East, they have a pretty good idea of the risks. And so if our approach is let's stop migration, um, we're not going to be successful. I think we need to recognize that many of them actually do get something out of it. They make money in the new place, they send money back home. Um, migration can be a positive force, but we need to think about what are the little things we can do to try and give them a better chance of a positive outcome. Um, and I don't think we have a great idea of what those factors are. What are the risk factors? What are the protective factors? And so one of the things we're doing is commissioning a study of exactly that. What are the protective factors for those women? Is it knowing the hotline number? Um, is it traveling in a group rather than on your own? Um, those questions. I would add to that that I think that there's actually, again, many layers uh, of intervention that are necessary in the current uh, 
so-called crisis, which is a, a steady state of crisis really in, in the Middle East. I think we need to think much more boldly and courageously about resettling people from the source. So don't not forcing people to go through this arduous kind of medieval trial of fire from country to country on the water uh, across mountains until they get to safety. We know, you know, that there are two million people in Turkey. There are one in every fourth person in Lebanon is a Syrian refugee. Now many of them face sh acute shortages of food and access to health care. We should have a proper resettlement program, not just an additional 10,000 for a country the size of America, which is what's been promised. We should be saying, let's take half a million people. Let's take half a million of these people, many of them trained, many of them skilled, all of them, you know, committed to building a new life and doing something and really think how we can safely accommodate them. That might sound a ludicrous number, but Germany's already accepted a million people. It's a much smaller country than the US. So that's one thing we should do. Secondly, I think what we really need to be thinking about is mechanisms for really addressing these conflicts earlier and in a more kind of aggressive way, not letting things get to the point so that those who migrate are migrating from a relative position of safety, not from a situation of absolute disintegration of everything that their life has ever been about. Thank you. Jocelyn, uh, Martina? Okay. Then let's... Uh, I'm sorry. I, can, I, can, I would love to pop in on that. Oh. So one of the, I, I couldn't agree more with Professor Baba about the importance of prevention, although I'm a big fan of prosecution and clobbering traffickers. But prevention is enormously, enormously important. But one of the things that we have done is by creating barriers for migrants who are trying to cross into countries, we have created a lucrative opportunity for traffickers. The harder it is to cross a border, the more expensive it will be for a trafficking victim. And in the trafficking survivors I've worked with, many of them have debts, and those debts are the debts that were accumulated by paying what they thought were smugglers, but turned out to be traffickers, right? Those barriers create huge, huge expenses for, for people who then become trafficking victims. And so I think we need to be very careful about facilitating safe migration for, tra for, for people to prevent trafficking. Like children from Central America to the United States. Absolutely, we have one case in the United States where children from Guatemala were <coughs> brought to the United States by people who had been paid by the children's parents. And the children's parents believed that they were paying smugglers. Little did they know, these people were actually traffickers. Those children from Guatemala ended up in the United States working on egg farms in Ohio, harvesting eggs for the American supermarkets. Luckily, that case was actually prosecuted by the federal government, but those cases are rare because they're difficult to identify. It's not that they don't happen, it's just that they're rarely prosecuted. Thank you very much. I think we, what we'll do at this point is to, uh, take a question or two from our, our, from our audience, uh, from our uh, online audience, and then we'll turn to you uh, to see if we can get a couple questions in. We'll go just slightly longer than uh, 1.30 to get a few of these questions in, some of the answers in. Uh, Lisa, you have a question from uh, uh, an audience member. Yes, uh, yes, an thank you. And thank you for addressing the immigrant and refugee question because a number of questions have come in. So um, I won't go into those, but here's one from our chat. Interesting point about the negative consequences when trafficking victim survivors are arrested. Are there any situations in which arrest sets off a chain of events that liberates a victim? This seems like the best case scenario. Maybe that's for so Martina. I would, I would I, actually disagree. I, I think uh, arresting a trafficking victim almost never is base case scenario. And the problem that we have is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I live in the world of concrete cases. In, in one concrete case, a case versus U.S. Subna, versus Subnani in Long Island, the law enforcement arrived to rescue a victim who was locked in a house, locked in domestic servitude. And when they finally found the victim, she was crouched hiding in a closet because she was absolutely convinced that the authorities were there to arrest her, detain her, and deport her in shame back to her country of origin. And so traffickers tell victims that they will be arrested and harmed, that they will be arrested and deported. That's part of the terror that the traffickers use. And so law enforcement should be enormously careful about not not arresting trafficking victims, it practically guarantees that they won't cooperate. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's another one. Is there a reduction in sex trafficking in places where prostitution is legalized? It's a great question. Anyone like to address that? Well, I, I, I would say that there are very divided views on this topic, and um, data is never pure. So there is a real controversy between those who favor legalization of prostitution, like myself, and uh, who argued that this uh, provides, uh, you know, a, a set of a supply, a legal supply, which can be protected and can be um, really akin to other forms of, of, of labor, some, some parallels at least to other forms of labor. Um, and then there are others who point to the so-called Swedish model and say, no, no, it's much better to, to criminalize prostitution. A any woman who is involved in prostitution is by definition, ipso facto, being exploited. Nobody who was really free would ever agree to this. Um, and so this is this is really something that we have to um, we have to get rid of, um, and we have to just be aggressive about reducing reducing the um, access to to, to 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 trafficked victims. I'm not sure I would be able to say that there's clear evidence that. Uh, um, legalization reduces uh, the demand for victims of trafficking, but I certainly think it's true to say that in the Swedish context, the criminalization of a prostitution has led many Swedes to go to neighboring countries where, where it's easier to find uh, you know, the supply that they're looking for. But Martina, you may have a better answer than mine. No, I think that answer was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> and my, my sense of this actually is that you know, we, we as advocates try to do no harm. And my experience of criminalization of prostitution actually does harm to survivors. I, I think it makes it more difficult. The, the actual criminal justice system and the criminalization of prostitution makes it far more difficult for trafficking victims to, to escape. I can give you an example. When I worked in Israel, I was working uh, in, in the prison in Israel because all of the trafficking victims, this was about a decade ago, all the trafficking victims had been arrested and they were sitting in prison. And one of the women was sitting in prison because a client took her to the Israeli police and she said, I'm trafficked, please help me. And they promptly arrested her and put her in prison for working illegally and for working in prostitution. So the, the criminal justice system has not been a friend to those who've been trafficked into the sex industry, and I'm very suspicious of criminalization generally. Just briefly, uh, the, the rapporteur in, uh, in Holland, in, um, uh, in The Hague, had basically worked with the former mayor of, uh, of Amsterdam, and they had concluded that a large percentage of the women who were uh, in prostitution, uh, willfully, in um, in Amsterdam, in the red light district, were in fact there against their wills. Uh, this was uh, this is a way that some individuals or some groups, like Demand Abolition, have uh, they've used this as an example to show that uh, by by making it legal, you actually exacerbate the problem. Well, what are your responses to that? Uh, they're saying that the problem actually worsened, and that you actually had a large percentage of women in the red light district, uh, ostensibly there willfully, uh, but actually against their wills. My answer to that is um, that, first of all, the, the, the distinction, as I always say to my students, uh, between something that's consensual and something that's coercive is not black and white for all time. Things can move. Somebody can say, yes, I agree to you know, to this job, I agree to this opportunity, and then it becomes oppressive. And then maybe after a debt is paid off again, they decide to stay on in this business. So I think it's it's difficult to generalize from one case uh, or from one situation. And uh, there certainly are people who are doing this because they think it's, you know, the only way they can feed their families. And there are others who are doing this in situations of enormous exploitation. So I, I, I'm not sure I would agree with that analysis. But um, again, this it's is, this it's is very, complex. very controversial uh, um, issue. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I know we're running out of time, so I, I do just encourage everyone to go on our chat, and I want to allow times for closing statements. Let's conclude. Let's hear from our, our, our panel, and um, uh, Jackie, we'll start with you. Well, I, I've spoken a lot. I just wanted to say one thing, which is actually we've been very fortunate to collaborate with the Freedom Fund, and we are just about to release a report, which is this is a sneak preview. It's called Troubles We Have to Face, 
the challenge of eradicating labor exploitation. And this is one methodology for addressing these problems, which is to really do careful research into what works. As Dan said, the Freedom Fund supports community-based organizations that are trying to really build the strength of these vulnerable communities to counter the oppression from the landlord or the debt collector or whatever. And we've evaluated one such very interesting uh, intervention um, over a period of three years in India. And so, uh, you know, nothing is simple. Our conclusions are complicated. Our analysis is very fairly detailed. But the good news is that we certainly do find that this community-based intervention, a bottom-up intervention, if you like, has really delivered substantial gains to the communities uh, in which the intervention took place by comparison with a control group. So my concluding point is that there are many different ways, and many of you in the audience may feel strongly about these issues like we do and want to help or get involved. And you can be a, a, a WISO lawyer like Martina, but you can also be a researcher or you can be an advocate like, like, like Jocelyn or, or a philanthropist or work with philanthropists like Dan. There are many different routes. And I would really encourage you all <coughs> to, to think about which one suits you best. Thank you. Dan? Um, well, we've talked a lot about uh, community-based organizations. I actually wanted to mention one um, structural route that we haven't talked a lot about, which is the role of the private sector. Um, you know, so many people who are in forced labor are in the supply chains of multinational companies. And one of the big issues is that um, the private sector is not incentivized to, to look at this, um, not so much in their own operations, uh, although that is an issue, but in the operations of those they're buying from. And so finding ways that we can get consumers um, to um, know when a private sector actor is very good and finding ways that we can get consumers to know when um, they are not fulfilling their responsibilities, such as investigative journalism, um, we need to be looking at those angles as well. <coughs> Jocelyn. Yeah, I mean, I think the discussion of the refugee movements and how instability in the Middle East, and particularly Syria, has changed the world really highlights how we're at this watershed moment right now in combating human slavery and conflict. And the problem is ever more pressing. We see groups like Boko Haram and ISIS using human slavery as a tool in their arsenal. And then we see the ripple effects of this instability really changing kind of the face of the world as we know it today. Um, and I think a key tool in combating sexual slavery and human trafficking in the world is to work with local communities to understand the pathways to slavery. And that requires both traditional and innovative research techniques. And it really helps us illuminate kind of both expected and unexpected narratives and risk factors in those areas. Um, I think it's important to support national and international prosecution. When the Bemba case was handed down to prosecute an Afghan warlord for the use of child soldiers, um, I was in Eastern DRC and we actually saw this enormous outflux of child soldiers just leaving the forest because they'd been liberated by these rebel leaders. And so don't give up hope. There are actually ways that national and international prosecution can have concrete effect on the ground. But hand in hand with that has to be um, a need to help both victims and potential victims before they get sucked into the system of trafficking. And that's going to be critical to building more peaceful societies. Thank you. Uh, Martina, a final comment from you? Yeah, so my, my, my final plea would be for everyone to realize that this is not hopeless. I think trafficking can sometimes feel like a, a hopeless conundrum. Um, I just want to point to sort of three success stories. One is the increasing leadership of survivors in the movement, both in the United States and internationally. Survivors are really stepping up and taking a role in developing policy. Um, the second is pivoting off of, Dan, uh, of, of Dan's point, we are seeing incredibly creative work among shareholders. Some of my favorite allies in this work who are enormously creative are the nuns. So the women religious are now going to corporations and saying, I represent X billion dollars in assets of your shares of your corporation and you need to clear your supply chain. I think some of these executives are shocked and stunned um, by the fact that a nun before them is, is actually a shareholder, represents shareholders, and is telling them to clean up, their, clean up their act and clean up their supply chain. And the last success is, you know, we're actually winning cases and winning restitution. The Palermo Protocol, the, the, the UN the UN law, the UN treaty on human trafficking, it requires restitution 
It requires compensation for victims. And we are actually now finally in 2015, we're finally winning these cases and being able to provide restitution and, and damages to survivors, which helps them become leaders. Martina, thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists. All of you have given, I mean, such extraordinary uh, uh, com uh, contextual, um, uh, if you will, contextual gravitas even to, to this uh, to this extraordinary issue, to this uh, uh, this issue which seems interminable, but it's not. Um, one an another example of um, I think fighting against human trafficking was this summer. Pope Francis convened a uh, conference on human trafficking and climate change that I reported on, uh, where he linked the two, and uh, uh, and he spoke to 68 mayors and asked them to take leadership. If uh, they're, if the legislators in their countries aren't doing it, he said you should do it on the grassroots level. And the same thing can be said, of course, people around this country and those who are watching this broadcast. Uh, you can do something, continue the conversation. Uh, you can uh, uh, continue this conversation at forumhsph.org. Tune in. Uh, the conversation is, uh, it will be, uh, it's not, it, not only live broadcast, but you can uh, continue to uh, broadcast this. Send it to your friends, uh, uh, tweet it, put it on Facebook. Let folks know that this issue is uh, it's something that people are talking about and doing something about. I'd like to thank all of you. Thank you very much.